Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. Today is a special day for us because we have Sri T V Mohandas Pai and Sri Sridhar Chityala um, as guests on our show today. Welcome to both of you, Sridhar Ji and Mohandas Pai Ji. Thank you. Namaskar. Thank you. Namaste. So uh, welcome to the cha uh, P Guru's channel, gentlemen and uh, viewers. Today we have a slightly different format. This is going to be an India US. Uh, the way forward uh, chat between two individuals who are accomplished gentlemen and uh, you all know Sri Mohandas Paiji, he is an uh, Infosys fame, he is a TV commentator, he is an author, he frequently writes articles that are well read and he has an opinion on everything and usually it is good, it is usually <laughs> something that I agree with him and uh, so we are in for a cracker of a session. Uh, Sri Sridhar Chityala is a banker He's an author and he's a venture capitalist based out of New York. Sridharji, I request you to take over the conversation from this point forward. Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sri Ayarji. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Mohan. Uh, Thank welcome. you very much. Welcome. welcome. So let me kind of set the context because not many people are aware of the strategic uh, nature of the U.S.-India relationship. And more importantly, what has happened in the past five years uh, under under Modi's leadership, under Trump Modi joint partnership. Okay, so let me set the opening context. So the U.S. India partnership is actually founded on a shared commitment to freedom, democratic principles, equal treatment of citizens, human rights, and rule of law. The U.S. and India have shared interests in promoting global security, stability, economic prosperity through trade, investment, and connectivity. The U.S. supports. India's emergence as a leading power and vital partner in efforts to ensure that the Indo-Pacific is a region of peace, stability, and growth prosperity. It was President Trump who recoined the Asia-Pacific into India-Pacific um, uh, naming, giving strategic importance to the value of India in the, in, in the region. The strong people ties between our countries reflected in 4 million strong Indian diaspora, which is a source of tremendous strength and for the partnership. In fact, they would be vital in the income ensuing elections that are due in November 2020. In December 2019, the United States hosted the second two plus two ministerial dialogue in Washington, led by the US secretaries of state and defense and their Indian counterparts, at which both sides reaffirmed India's status as a major defense partner and deepened cooperation on maritime security, interoperability, and information sharing. Now, this whole two plus two again is something that's been developed between uh, Modi and Trump, and changing the what used to be the traditional kind of bilateral uh, James Baker James Baker type of policy. And this has actually helped both the countries in pursuing the dual defense and diplomacy going hand in hand. While the two plus two serves as the premier dialogue between US and India, there's more than 30 bilateral dialogues and working groups which, which span all aspects, ranging from human endeavor, space, health cooperation, to energy and high technology trade. The health aspect of it, India rose to the occasion when President Trump requested hydroxychloroquine to be exported breaking the traditional norms that India followed. And in 48 hours, Modi changed the policy and committed and exported 30 million tablets to meet the US needs, demonstrating the strong strength as well as endeavor to cooperate on human needs. These include US-India terrorism, joint working group, which was established in 2000, and is among our oldest government to government dialogues, as well as strategic energy partnership, cyber dialogue, civil space working group, trade policy forum, defense policy, and many more. Not many people are aware of the expansive span of relationships that India and US enjoy. On the economic front, the US seeks an expanded trade relationship with India that is reciprocal and fair. In 2019, the overall U.S. bilateral trade in goods and services reached $150 billion, $150 billion. U.S. energy exports are an important source of growth in this partnership. 
with a target of 500 billion, roughly representing 10% of 5 trillion by 2026, I think this US-India trade partnership is pivotal in, in terms of the growth that India is aspiring to achieve. So where did this come from? In 2018, India purchased 48.2 million barrels of US crude. President Trump had committed that it will deliver the crude at a competitive price, moving it away from its traditional partners to reaffirm this whole concept of strategic partnership. This actually rose from 9.6 million barrels in 2017 to about 48.2, reflecting again the strategic trust and the partnership. That's what gave the impetus and displaced China as the number one strategic partner or trading partner. Last year, Indian students enrolled at US colleges and universities contributed 8 billion, I repeat, 8 billion to the US economy. In his address, Subramaniam Jaishankar made this point at the Columbia University, which he said, today we export by education more money than anybody can contemplate relative to what it was a few years ago. In 2008, there was only 81,000. So it's a threefold increase relative to where it was 10 years ago. On international cooperation, India and US cooperate closely at multilateral organizations, including UN, G20. In fact, uh, Mr. Trump invited Modi to be at the G7, much to the displeasure of the Chinese. So be it World Bank, be it United Nations, be it ASEAN, be it the uh, Indian Ocean Economic Cooperation, India and US are tied hand in hand. Another important data point is that US is the largest single investor, roughly putting 45 billion to 48 billion dollars into India. But when you look at United States overall, it spends $5.95 trillion in overseas investments annually. So $50 billion is a very small number. So Mr. Modi must negotiate hard with Mr. Trump to ask for more share of action as a reciprocal gesture to what Modi has given to him by way of crude oil trade to drive Indian economy. So this is the strategic kind of context in terms of trade, investments, commerce, and security, Mohan. So with this context, so where do we take the U.S.-India partnership now? Uh, Sridhar, the India-U.S. partnership is flourishing. It is people to people, government to government, and we have 4 million Indians there. Some of the best, brightest minds of India have left us and gone there. They're ambassadors. They contributed to the United States. They have the highest per capita income highest per capita education, and they're very well settled. And I think we're all very proud of them. And like you said, the number one destination for students to go, 205,000 students out of 750,000 students are in the United States, and more are waiting to come if you give them the visa. Yes, we're spending a lot of money, but uh, our friends understand that the best higher education in the world is in the United States. In STEM education, in other forms of education, there are no university system like the United States. And I think this should go to $500 billion in the next maybe five to seven years, led by technology, led by natural resources, led by services, led by tourism, led by oil, etc. The US is a $21, $22 trillion economy. It's a very large importer. And India can export a lot of the stuff that the US imports from other parts of the world. For example, Sridhar, uh, this year we'll import, export about maybe eight to ten billion dollars of mobile phones now apple has come here and apple is uh, contemplating shifting 10 percent of its global uh, iphone production to india in the near future and india can be a very large exporter of uh, mobile phones and electronics to the united states now the defining relations of the 21st century i believe will be india and the united states why is that we are both large democracies us is the oldest democracy then are older than us, and we are the largest democracy. And you know, we are a democracy with deep-rooted respect for individual freedom, the same value system that the United States has. And we don't want any hegemony. The US also doesn't want any hegemony, though it plays the role of the world's policeman and tries to make sure the world is safe for everybody. 
is a very open, transparent society. We are a very open, transparent society. But best of all, see that our GDP of $3 trillion as of March 2020 is expected to grow to $10 trillion by 2021. And that means the highest rate of growth for any large economy in the next 10 years is going to be in India. And we are a young country. Average age of India is 27 years. The United States is 31 years. Europe is 45 years. So we are a young country. We are going to grow. We are democratic. The US is on. And we are people to people relationship. Political relationship improved tremendously under the last two administrations in this country. And also the last two administrations of last three, four administration from the United States. And now, Sridhar, we have a large hegemon in China. China has become a hegemon, is a, is a great power. We have to accept that China is a great power, $15.5 trillion GDP, and is going to grow. In PPP, it is more than the United States at $29 trillion. And that is very, very large. In PPP, India is $12.5 trillion today. So I think it was the Asia to be safe, for Asia to be an open society, an open, open system, you need India to flourish. And I think to tackle the challenges of global terrorism, to tackle the challenges of a global peace, uh, global peace, uh, tackle the challenge of climate change, you need India and the US to be together. And that, I think, is going to be the defining partnership. So what you said about $150 billion is very encouraging. We should work to take it up to $500 billion as early as possible. The scope is there for both countries. Great. Thank you, Mohan. Thank you. So now if we um, look at that, uh, the data, during the same period in 2018, 2019, uh, as at 2020, China is trending to about 140 to 160 billion dollars in direct foreign direct investments relative to India's, you know, 50 billion dollars, almost one third. Given the flight of capital is always towards a venue which has got the highest economic multiplier on a shorter duration, which is a trajectory of three trillion from 2020 to a 10 trillion. You know, seven trillion dollars is going to be added in gross economic <clears throat> value. So naturally, there has to be a case made to United States to say 50 billion is far too little. OK, I'm generating returns for the country. So how can you increase it to $100 billion? Because $50 billion over the next seven years is about $350 billion. On a multiplier of three, you can easily add $1 trillion to the GDP. So what would be the uh, what would be the uh, the things that, you know, if you have to recommend Modi to Trump, what would be the things that you would do, Mohan? Well, Sridhar, the banker in you is giving all those figures. It's fascinating how you reel out the figures. I think it's very interesting. Sridhar, in the last two years, we opened up India to FDI everywhere. Even in defense, we open up to good FDI. So there is nothing that is left except some control items like, let's say, the nuclear industry, which needs to be controlled for safety reasons and for security reasons. So India is very open for business. What India needs now at the point of time is to have a free trade agreement with the United States. India is to stand up and sign a free trade agreement with the United States first, then go to Europe to sign a free trade agreement with the United States. India did not sign that big agreement in Asia for a very important reason. We already have a free trade agreement with ASEAN, with Japan. But in that agreement, we had China come in. And China is a big beast. Chinese will dump. It's a state mercantilist economy. The state subsidizes. Would have come and dumped and destroyed any economy like they've done to America over the past uh, many years because they will not they open the economy to you, but you know they will come and conquer everything because they're a very different system. And I don't think many countries know how to compete with China because you're competing with a government of a 15.5 trillion dollar economy. So I think the key today is to market India properly, go to Trump and say we want to sign a free trade agreement with you. We want to expand to expand your trade. For there are some safety India wants. For example, America wants to export uh, the dairy industry. They want to export other uh, meat industry. You know, India is just saying that uh, you can uh, send us uh, milk and everything else. You can export, but we don't want your cows to be fed the animal residue, uh, which is being fed to all the cows, many of the cows in the United States. So there are some nuances which we want, and I think the United States has put tariffs on Indian steel as part of Trump's big tariff plan, that has to go. So I think we need more communication. We need to go market houses. 
and we need to make sure that Indians, the American companies come here in a much bigger way. Look at the tech industry, Sridhar. All the big tech companies are here. They got huge number of employees. Look at uh, the uh, financial services industry. New York and Bangalore are hand in glove. They pass the work to and fro all the time. And look at Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley and Bangalore are hand in glove. So I can say from Bangalore, we are closer to Silicon Valley than to Delhi. If we go to Delhi, the language looks very different. We come to the valley, you know, the language is the same because people are the same. They communicate, they work, etc. I think the key thing is marketing, signing a free trade agreement with the United States and importing more of U.S. oil. Now, the U.S. oil is coming back. U.S. is the largest, uh, you know, producer of oil in the world and export three and a half million a day. And I think uh, India, yeah, there's only about, uh, you know, the export of U.S. is only about 30% uh, of what India consumes and imports. So I think it's time to expand that. And that is happening in a big way because that gives us energy security. And yeah. that makes us come closer together. I think there's a lot of scope. We should get in the details. But the big issue, political issue, is the free trade agreement. And also, Shida, maybe you should work with the Trump administration, any administration, to clean up the green card. Now, there's a huge backlog of green cards, right? If you have a one, if you have a one time, one time cleanup to say everybody who has applied for a green card, let's say till one year ago, we don't have to stand in the queue. We're going to give you citizenship immediately because all of them are working. They're already working. They're not going to take away anybody's jobs because they already got jobs. That will be a big plus, plus, plus. And you'll have a large number of Indians who will be supporters of whichever administration does that. So I'm sending you a message and that will add to everything that we do. And in terms of uh, services, you know, our students want to come to America. They want to study. America had about 500,000 Chinese students, and now Chinese students are not going to come in such a large number. Many of the American universities are having a difficulty, and India can have another 100,000 students on a payment basis come and learn in, in the United States for higher education and add to the intellectual capital of both India and the United States. So many, many areas see them. Got it, got it. Thanks, Mo. So I think if I, two takeaways is that if the student base is increased from 202,000 to about 300,000, roughly the uh, inflow of capital or the export of capital goes from $8 billion to $12 billion in terms from that only one sector, which is the education sector. I think that's one of the yeah. key messages that we need to kind of give as substitution occurs because of the conflict and tensions that exist between India and China. And you may see a natural kind of reduction in number of students coming from there. I think the second point that you're talking about, which I don't know from an economic point of view, but naturally from an emotional point of view, this one of cleaning up of this green card clearly kind of wraps up the emotional point, which is there's going to yes. be far more people working here and uh, they're already working here. And maybe, you know, as an exception rather than, you know, they're not illegal, they're legal aliens, but just because yeah, of the legal. Process, Huh? They are legal. See, they are the, legal. see that? See that? There was a Pew Research uh, report. I read a few years. Please refresh my memory. You might know that. It says there are three or four countries in the world where the people of the country love America the most, the most popular country. Yeah. India is one of them. Israel is another. Right? What would be the government policy? The people of India look up to America for many reasons. See that? In the independence struggle, America stood by India all the time. They put British on the British Empire to free India. In fact, in Yalta in 1943, Roosevelt had a conference with Churchill and Stalin to get a post-war world. And the Roosevelt made Churchill promise to give freedom to India. I think that's very important. In 1962, in the China war, uh, JFK came to the rescue because Nehru had almost uh, made, uh, you know, tried to destroy our army and we were, you know, we were in trouble. And uh, in 67, 68, when we had, uh, Famine in India, and there was real danger. And we had the PL 480 come to us. Which country would have uh, come and help India at that point of time? And also after that, we had Norman Rock come here for the Green Revolution and give us that Mexican wheat variety to make sure that India becomes food surplus because food is a very critical issue for security of any country. And of course, we had our challenges in 1971. We had a challenges in the Cold War, but all the challenges have gone away because the Cold War has gone away. And uh, today. India and the United States are natural allies, like we all say. It is just that politically they have to come together. I think it requires a strong leader 
to take the first step. And we have a strong leader in India who is <coughs> going to take the first step. And I think uh, we should look forward to better days. Got it. Thanks, Mohan. If you look at the um, um, IT model, right, uh, you guys built the IT from ground up uh, to almost, uh, you know, $200 billion industry today in a very short span of time. Are there any lessons that one can learn from that particular model and replicate, particularly around this investment and growth of bilateral trade? Obviously, U.S. was the predominant driver of your IT growth. Yes, Sridhar. There are many lessons to learn. First, be open to the world and don't be scared of overseas competition. So the IT industry had 100% overseas investment. IBM came here, everybody came here. They were in the same services business. But what in services IBM did, they came here, hired the Indians, trained them, they left and worked for other companies and grew the industry, right? <laughs> because the most important thing in services is yeah. intellectual capital. Yeah. The fact that you've got Microsoft here, Facebook here, everybody here, that means they're training the Indian brain. And the Indian brain will remain in India for a large part. So you're creating a pool of great people who are working very hard in technology and giving them access to the cutting edge uh, technology. And now in the new education policy, Sridhar, uh, India has said that we welcome 100 of the top universities to come and set up shop in India. And we set up rules whereby you will have full academic freedom to give the degrees you give in the United States. So India is open to higher education too for people coming here and setting up universities just to show that India is uh, very open. The second lesson we had uh, was to make sure that we adopt a model which is called the global delivery model where the whole globe is a market. So once you adopt a model where the whole globe is a market, you will have a $85 trillion GDP market for you rather than a $3 trillion GDP market. And that for India, I think is very important. And the US can come here and use India as an export base can use India to export U.S. goods to other parts of the world like they use China. They use China to produce and to export everywhere, and that can be done. And the third thing that we learned in the Indian IT service industry is to have the highest standards possible in the world, CMM Level 5. India has the highest number of companies certified to CMM Level 5. I think that is astonishing. India has the highest number of FDA registered certified you know, pharma companies after the United States. That is remarkable. So adopt the highest standards in the world. And the next most important thing that we learn is to buy the best technology. And the best technology is that IT equipment made by the great American, uh, American companies. And the next is go set up marketing in the United States and uh, hide locally. Today, I'm very proud to see that most of the big IT companies have more than 50% of the people they employ in the United States who are locals. They've gone to the smaller towns, they hide them, they build campuses, etc. And they have produced results. So I think to be an open industry, to compete at the global level, allow competition to come to your market, don't try to defend your market and put it on, you know, develop your intellectual capital in the best way. And as far as investment is concerned, Sridhar, I mean, most of India's biggest companies, the Americans own more stock than Indians. HDFC banks has 70% uh, of FD, FD, uh, FPI holding, most of it American, right? Infosys yep. has about 52, 53, 52, 53%. If you okay. have the ADR, it's 65%. So they're already there. I think much more can come. What we need is a manufacturing base. I think that's where we need the American companies to come. What we need is defense because India, you know, imports about 15, 16 billion dollars and you could go up in defense. That's a very big market. And what we need is more people to people contract, more direct flights. Why can't we have more American airlines flying to India? Because we have a large number of tourists and other business people going to the United States. They go via Dubai or they go via maybe other places. Why can't they come here directly and fly? And today, I think some of our airlines are trying to look at direct flights. I heard that uh, one U.S. airlines wants to have a direct flight from San Francisco to Bangalore. That will be good news. I think today, with China becoming a difficult, a difficult animal to tackle because the Chinese policies, India and the U.S. are coming together. But it requires people like you and Sri and everybody else to foster this dialogue, get people together, and to tell um, Americans that we are the natural allies. We are both democratic. We are open societies. They're always welcome here. And we are a country which respects America like no other country. Yeah. No, I think these are excellent points, uh, Mohan. I think one of the challenges that we face, both in India and United States, is the qualitative database narrative 
It Absolutely. always goes into very emotional, esoteric, redundant kind of a dialogue with the whole objective of masking the economic importance to both the countries. Because United States, as you know, when it suffers, it goes into sub 1% growth. At its peak, yeah. it grows, you know, it toggles between 3 to 4%. So growth is much needed for United States for it to sustain in terms of its economic output. So that can only come not from a domestic consumption, which is going on quite well, but has to come from the capital being deployed in areas and locations which gives it the multiplier. But we don't have a quality narrative that is taking place, Mohan. I think that's one of the big challenges. Would you I agree? I agree. I agree because, you know, we have seen Pakistan put in a lot of money to lobby. We have Islamist groups in the United States who are spending a lot of money to negate whatever India does. Uh, you've seen what happened when uh, Prime Minister Modi came there. There were groups trying to oppose that for no reason. And we have some leftist Indians there who always try to rubbish India, beat on India for no single reason, except they seem to hate that uh, India should be prosperous. They get all kind of fake narratives uh, that is done. You know, I want to give you data, Sridhar. Article 29 and 30 of our constitution, which was formed in 1950, gives special rights to minorities. We have 200 million Muslims in this country. They got special rights. The Hindus of this country don't have as many rights as the Muslims. Tell me, which country has given minorities so much of rights? And, you know, we spend money. We got minority departments at the federal government and the state government spending a lot of money on their welfare, especially. We are given 50% reservation in government jobs to disadvantage sections in this country, starting with 22.5% from 1950 onwards in education, public sector education, institutions, in government, etc. And today, happy to say all the disadvantaged groups are close to the population percentage in student population in Indian newspaper. We have done so much over the last many years, but we are not able to it. We are not able to talk about it. And we let some of the JNU crowd all go to the United States in the social studies uh, issue and rubbish India, because for most of them, rubbishing India gets them sympathy, because creating a victimhood narrative, creating a victimhood narrative seems to be the norm in some of these uh, social science departments in the United States. And they, everybody seems to join together. And by creating that, they're able to ingratiate say, themselves. And half, most of it is not very low. There are incidents in this country. We recently re released a report which shows that sexual crimes in India are less than most countries in the world. And most people who rubbish India don't look at data. They take single events and blow it up into a very big thing. What you said is correct. We need to build a narrative in the United States. We need to look at the economic factors. We look at India's contribution, the U.S. contribution to India, and we need to have more interactions at a mature level, and we need to spend more money lobbying. The yeah. United States is a lobbying country. We need to have many more people walking the aisles of Congress talking about India and giving all this data so that yeah. people can have a different narrative. Got it, got it, got it. No, I think that the, um, the, the uh, just because you touched on this specific point, one of the important things that we need to mention here is, you know, if you're talking about India receiving $50 billion or $52 billion of direct investment and a bilateral trade of $150 billion and growing, the foreign direct investment into China, uh, into Pakistan is $1.8 billion. Direct investment into Bangladesh is $1.2 billion. You can see why an economic narrative is redundant to them to them, a political and an emotional narrative spending a few hundred million dollars is basically to disrupt this economic outcome, which otherwise would flow into India. But nobody kind of lays it out in that type of a framework. When you lay it out to say, largest export will be so large exp exporter of crude. We haven't even touched natural gas. Um, yeah. largest the largest destination for pharma, largest destination for mobile and electronics largest destination for IT and an economic multiplier as the trade grows because US is one of the largest sources of disposable investment capital. I think, but unfortunately people don't, they always shift it to this narrative of appeasement, you know, discrimination and, you know, people being objected to Article 370, CAA, all those issues which are pretty irrelevant because economic prosperity is what people require not all these other things. Would you agree with that, Mohan? 
I totally agree, agree, Shrikar. India is one of the freest societies in the world. India is one of the freest societies in the world. Look at the fundamental rights. Look at the enforcement of those rights. Our crime rate is less than many countries in the world. The data is very clear. But people pick up individual incidents. We are 1.38 billion people. We're going to have the largest number of suicides in the world. We're going to have the largest number of most things in the world. But per billion, it is very, very low. And you can't pick up all this because we have led this set of people this kind of narratives led by the Lutians media. I think it's very important that people like Sri from there are trying to rectify this because all this will help to change the narrative to a very positive narrative and look at data and facts. Today, the narrative is being driven by ideology, particularly the leftist ideology, which is going there to the US in the academic campuses too. We must let the data and facts be in the front. For example, on the CAA, Sridhar, the CAA is an amendment act. It's just two and a half pages. It doesn't impact any Indian citizen. It doesn't take over the rights of anybody to come to India to seek refuge before the CAA was passed and after the CAA is passed. It is a limited time for people who came in from those six communities till 31st December 2014. The same communities come out the 31st December 2014. They have to stand in the queue for 12 years. So what has it changed? It's only limited. And suddenly it has blown up into all kinds of stuff. And we are not able to uh, um, oppose that with our own narrative because I don't think we did a good job. I think the problem is, Sridhar, we are, we, are, we are not able to talk about what you achieved. We are not able to be more positive. We are, able, we are not able to tell the world what we can do without boasting about it. We need to learn marketing from you people in the United States. <laughs> I mean, the United States is the best country for marketing. I think we should send all the people there to get trained in marketing and putting the point across and in communicating. And if you're able to do that, you can do, for example, a peak gurus alone has turned the tide on the narrative in many areas. She is a one-man army, done a fantastic work in changing the narrative. And today, my wife was telling me, oh, you're going to be on peak gurus at 8.30. Well, there you she go. never told me when I go to any of the Indian channels, but it told me, ah, you're going to be on peak gurus. So you can imagine, Sri, what you have done to people in this country because <laughs> they believe in what you are talking about India. I agree with you, Sri, that we have to change the dialogue, we have to change the narrative, and that all of us have to work together. Right, right. Thank you, thank you, Mohan, thank you. Thank you for those kind words, Mohan Das Paiji, and uh, please continue, Sri Ji. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mohan, I think one point before we uh, shift to one other topic. Uh, one is, this agroeconomy is one of the important areas of focus in terms of automation and extracting productivity. I mean, uh, because it's like a feast and famine situation, very much driven by monsoons. Um, but you need to change a specific model. Is there areas where United States can help uh, in that specific domain uh, in the retooling of the agro sector? I think the United States can help India by working with India to improve productivity of what we produce. Right. I think it's very important because we have Shidhar, the second largest amount of irrigated land in the world the highest amount of arable land in the world. We have more arable land than China, but China produces twice the food that we produce. All right, so it feeds the hogs, much of the grain that it produces. All right, we are the largest milk producer in the world, 171 million tons. Second largest fruits and vegetable producer in the world, 305 million tons. We will still import American uh, uh, American fruits like apples, <laughs> like you are now. And uh, even if you look at sugarcane, the largest, the second largest in the world, in all agri commodities, we are a very large producer, second largest producer of food in the world, 292 million tons. This year, we could go to 300 million tons. We have 75 million tons of rice and wheat in our stockyard. We feed half the world. So what America can help us is to improve productivity and work with India to tackle the export market. America is a large exporter of agriculture commodities, all right? But much, much, many parts of the world require much more. And India and the US should work together to see how we both jointly can tackle the world. Because in much of the world, there is hunger. There's a lack of food. Food security is required. And I think we both have to work together. Got it. So in other words, very similar to the energy security, food security is what, what should be one of the priority areas. Again, once again, the data needs to be presented to the US and U.S. can most certainly help in that in, in the specific domain, especially around, as you said, you know, storage, quarantine, transportation, logistics, preservation, etc., which would help the produce to be converted into 
you know, final uh, consumable uh, product. Yep. There's no issue on production. It is the other factors uh, which is the which is the mitigator. That's that's your uh, statement. Yes. Yep. Great. Yes, we are we are producing enough, but we have to process it. We have to preserve it. We have to sort it out, get quality, and uh, build the stuff that everybody can consume and reduce cost. About 25, 30 percent of fruits and vegetables are wasted. They don't even go to the uh, go to the table because they're all wasted because of lack of processing. And you know, Shap Sridhar will be very happy. In the last four years, 500 agri-tech startups have come up. Agri-tech startup started by young techies who are now improving productivity, connecting farmers to market, getting them 25-30% more and helping them to grade, sort and improve quality and giving them apps where they can track every moment of the way using uh, soil, uh, because, you know, finding out the chemical composition of soil, using uh, drones to find out the condition of the crop, and using high level photography to find out what to do where and the precision watering and the weather analysis to make sure when to water, what to do, when to cut the crop and link it in the market. A very sophisticated agri tech has come up, but we need to scale it up. I think America is the master there in food processing, etc. And I think we need to improve that as the middle class comes up, they're going to need much more of this process. India's consumption is going to go up and I think it's very, very important. Got it. Thank you. Um, so I think from trade investments, you know, we can we can pursue this topic, uh, but I do want to touch on one other topic, which is quite relevant. There is a consistent pattern of, you know, you can pick whether it is 10, 15, 20 um, journalists. Uh, we call them as the Lutian media. They seem hell bent day in and day out on advocacy. Right, advocacy, which seems to occupy every front page. You deliver a good news, then you have an advocacy. So how, I mean, this problem is common because what Modi ji faces in India is what Mr. Trump faces in the United States. So the question is, how do we kind of address this issue? Because lots of people here get rattled by looking at this news and anything which is fake and false is pursued as almost real. Well, Sridhar, we have the problem, the Lutians media. Who is the Lutians media? They are a set of people who are close to the center of power in the ancient regime. The ancient regime was a very corrupt regime, which had people close to the center of power who enjoyed the fruits of that office, the goodies of the office. They got plots of land. They got a lot of stuff for them. They got government advertisement, etc. And suddenly, with the new administration of Prime Minister Modi, they're all out. Because there is no corruption in Modi's government. He will not tolerate corruption. He will not tolerate any favoring. He will not give in to cronies. It's a very clean administration, as he is in the last six years. So they're all out, and they're out to get him because he doesn't talk to them, he doesn't allow them to come. It's ideological. They are the new fascists. They are the new fascists because they got a totalitarian bent of mind. They do not depend on truth or data. They spin their own narratives. There was one journalist who wrote rotten stuff about a a terrorist in Kashmir glamorized the terrorist to say he was the son of a school teacher and he was a person who was so and so. And this guy took the gun shot in cold blood many of the panchayat members. You don't glamorize a killer, right? You don't glamorize a killer. He was a killer. And in Kashmir today, all the jihadis and killers are glamorized as if they're doing something extraordinary. I see these news items appearing in the American media, particularly Washington Press and New York Times. I see it happening in the Nikki Asian Review because you know there are a group of people who are doing that. I think in the New York Times you got a news editor, uh, you know current affairs news editor who's a former Kashmiri, uh, Kashmiri jihadi, and you got in there. So you got this penetration of all these groups who are now putting together, trying to create a fake narrative, and you got a fake uh, person whose uh, book was shown as evidence in a case in the Supreme Court. They threw it out, saying this is all fake. Who's writing nasty articles? and uh, telling lies in the Washington Post about India on the CAA and everything else. So you got this set of people doing that. But the good news is see that young people of this country are waking up. You go to social media, anytime those people write, every, all these people stand up and show them fake. They show them the truth. So the social media has democratized media. Social media has made everything else. What we require now is a group of uh, young people who will stand up for truth, who will stand up for India, and will point it to all the fake uh, narratives being created in the global media and use all the social media to point out to them you're wrong 
and do this. For example, three days back, you had a, a fact verification uh, uh, database which has which has inaugurated. You were there in the inauguration. Right. Did everybody. BBC called India the rape capital of the world. It's rubbish. Sexual sexual uh, you know misconduct or sexual crimes in India is one of the least in the world on a per million basis. And just because we had some in unfortunate incidents of rape, they blew it up and said India is the rape capital. This is all rubbish. That we got we got about 650 million women in this country. They all live safely. Come on, 650 million women. That's more than the population of Europe, more than the population of the United States. And if you look at all this data, so they're there. Young people are doing it. They set up new media. They're coming out with videos. They're coming out in main things. And this has, I think, gone up 10x in the last uh, five years. And you know, if you go to our TV channels today, you have people like uh, Dr. A. R. Ranganathan who speaks the truth, who comes out and uh, talks about the truth, points out to all these uh, people. Well, see that we had a riots by Muslims in Bangalore. All right, the Lutins media came to India, came to Bangalore, tried to white to say that you know what they quoted an unnamed policeman to say, oh, they were all frustrated because of uh, COVID. They were at home and they did. There was no unknown policeman who will ever make the statement. They attacked the police station. I called up my Muslim friends and told them, we have to stand together. Even if it differs, there should not be violence. In Bangalore, they all stood together and said, we don't condone violence. We are against violence. They made a statement. They're all good people. The Muslims of Bangalore are very good people. They will not come to all this uh, you know, extremist uh, press and all this uh, you know, malcontents who operate communally. They will not do that. When there is some communal incident on the Hindu side, we all stand up and condemn. So all of us should be together to say this is wrong. But the ground cell opinion is coming up with social media. I think a lot of things is coming. And today, people are not seeing the TV channels. You know, the mm. most popular TV channel is a friend, Anab Goswami. Anab Goswami has da daily gladiator fights. I think, uh, you know, Sri Ayo knows him very well. Gladiator fights is <laughs> great fun. Everybody sees it. They don't yeah. go to the traditional uh, New Delhi media, which used to run all these fake narratives. And the revenues have come down. People are not going there. The advertisements have come down. They're still getting advertised from the state government or the ancient regime because they're very close to them. So they run fake narratives. I think people have found out because today, see that there's great transparency. Why is P Guru so popular in India? Because people see P Guru and know they're speaking the truth. They speak facts as they lie and they portray the correct image of India. If you do a mistake, they say you're making a mistake. They're critical. Otherwise, they say this is it. I think it's important. Young people are fighting back. Young people are coming up. There's a great upsurge of a good feeling for India. And highly educated young people are standing up for the country. Earlier, they were indifferent. I was also indifferent, Sridhar. I was indifferent. I didn't know all this. I saw it when I was uh, working at Infosys. But later, when I finished my Infosys uh, tenure, when I came out, I found that I'm, I'm discriminated in my country. I'm part of, I, I'm a minority, Sridhar. You better be careful with me. Don't criticize me too much. I'm a minority <laughs> on the rank 29 and 30 as a company. But yeah. you know, being part of the 79% of India's population, we are discriminated. Our temples are run by government. Can you believe it? I mean, no. in any country, our temples and churches and uh, mass run by any government. So we suffer this, yet we are made the victims. I mean, we are shown that we are the oppressors. We are the victims. We are shown the oppressor because we are good people. Now, mm. all these young people are standing up and pointing this out. And I think it's a good thing that's happening. And I think even the newspapers, I think the good things happening. We saw some of the journalists start digital media. They're not succeeding. They're not getting argument. People are not watching them. And people are bashing them up because they run fake narratives. And they push their ideology in a very direct manner. And today, people know the truth. Because of social media, they know the truth. We don't have close media anymore. So I think it's remarkable that things are happening in this country. And we'll see a sea change. But it's a part of a global phenomena. The, you have it in the United States where people, you know, run fake narratives against your president. We have it in India. They run fake narratives because they don't like that. Uh, you got you got people from outside the establishment coming and ruling the country and they are uh, removing the cozy arrangement everybody had with the power systems and the power brokers. So the power brokers and the establishment had a very cozy arrangement and forget about the people of the country, right? The cozy arrangement is going because the focus is the people of the country and the benefit for the largest number of people in the United States and in India, and even in the UK, and even in other parts of the world, and that is rattling these people. And uh, I think it's important we are, we are undergoing a big change in the world. The old regime that came into being after the fall of the Soviet Union, and the fall of the communists, and after the fall of the uh, Berlin Wall, 
and they build this kind of a narrative of victim mode that i think is sort of declining now got it so i think we are seeing the same in united states and you probably uh, you know seeing it in the press you know as capital after capital state uh, capitals we have seen this movements um, happening um, uh, very similar to what you have uh, fueled and fed by the left narratives uh, and you don't burn buildings you don't burn police stations you don't burn you know important offices and commercial shops and you don't loot these venues to actually um, you know change the change the change the law of the land uh, that somehow uh, it, it, this uh, what you call animal spirit has been fed into these people and you know you are seeing this frenzied momentum it almost seems like a political agenda for these people to achieve a specific outcome rather than really solving the economic issues so that we had the ICA agitation nobody understood how ca is going to impact muslims in that in this country first of all it does not impact any indian citizen so it doesn't apply to indian muslims indian hindus it is for a limited number of people who are in uh, persecuted for the religion in pakistan afghanistan and bangladesh to come to india and get citizenship if they not already got it for a limited period of time and that is it there's nothing else there was no discrimination against anybody they were all in the street saying there's discrimination there was no discrimination they're all in the street saying that equality is not there where the question of equality for a small carver equality is already there and when you deal with people from outside your country you have a right to protect yourself in any manner that you want as an independent sovereign country like the united states is doing yes you have to be compassionate to people who come from outside to seek refuge if they are religiously persecuted you must help them out you have an obligation under the un human rights convention which india is doing in a very big way so i think that narrative ran for a pretty long time and they were and they, who gave the money extremist organization give the money and there were many of this lutians media film stars going there and showing that they do none of them could answer any questions and then they said you don't have a nrc there is no nrc in this country yes the government wanted to have a nrc but they're not shown us what kind of condition nobody knows what it is but they want to do it and they push it to the assam accord the assam accord came out the assam thing is is under the super supreme court it's been run by the supreme court not the government of india not the government the supreme court is monitoring it and will you accuse the supreme court of india we stand for justice to put your constitution into force of discriminate against anybody you can't you can't do that and the and the issue is not at over nobody has been put in detention camps nobody has been to throw out anybody nobody has been identified identified is going on and it's part of an accord signed by rajiv gandhi i think in 1984 or 85 are is getting implemented today under court orders now suddenly the whole argument has turned india is doing this india is doing this you had this uh, seattle resolution you had the minnesota resolution and suddenly you had this silly resolution in san francisco which are all based on lies the narrative is just not there because this lutians media picked up the narrative put it put out all the fake news and you know instigated the poor muslims who are innocent in many parts because they have not read the act they don't know possibly how to read uh, that amendment act and they didn't know they put the thing in them you are under threat they are all do men who going and saying the government will kick us out see that nobody can throw out an indian citizen citizenship comes by the constitution of india citizenship comes by the citizenship act of 1955 in this country and if indian citizen the court will stand we will all stand with indian citizens nobody can be no indian citizen can be thrown out of this country unless some men fly away to the uk and live in luxury like uh, your friend uh, your friend see the but you know, my friend, spend the my friend i know i know my friend <laughs> is my friend from yes. our from our common state mohan you know you know <laughs> i know i know uh, from a I common know. state um no yeah, i think I the, uh, the the point that you're making is very important i think for, for us in the united states we have to in all these instances the common theme is education right we always seems to be you know catching the tail rather than blocking the head which is we should have uh, in united states realize the undercurrent of what is happening by the way it's only not five councils there's more 40 more councils in the line so we actually have to educate our not only our republican senators you know i come from the republican side of the fence but we have to also educate the democratic senators which is to say look you have to understand that this is a long long term people culture economic strategic partnership you cannot use lopsided views 
and make decisions which makes you in the end look like a laughing stock right you don't want to hear you don't want to study the law and some of the counselors even went on to say we won't see this but we'll make a decision i mean such is the naivete of some of these people and they eventually by the way turn up and become either house representatives or senators that is what is the danger that is lurking ahead because if such people come to power and make policy decisions you can imagine the damage that it unleashes on the world right so that i understand that sudha uh -huh. that's why india has to have more lobbying <coughs> india has to have larger amounts of money and our uh, indian brothers in the brothers and sisters in the united states have to do their work yep i think lot more work for all of you to see sridhar so long as people have the data and flags how they interpret it is open to them that's fine we are all a free society but let us not meddle up with the data and facts the data and facts are the data and facts we can all read them and that is the law we can do that right and then it comes to policy you can be critical of policy but if you refuse to read what the law is refuse to understand what the data is the truth is then you know i don't know how you can ever debate anything talk anything or do anything it's just conjecture and also see the this recent tendency to glorify violence is very wrong nobody should glorify violence nobody should justify violence you can justify any violence no violence in any part of the world can be justified on the ground of being a form of dissent you can't do that and in fact in delhi they were trying to justify violence in bangalore lutens media is only meddling in bangalore trying to justify violence you can't justify violence violence that's a line we have to draw as civilized people from civilized countries we will not accept any violence we can dissent we can march we can show our anger we can you know protest etc but no violence that is not acceptable should not be acceptable in any part of the world got it thank you so to be continued mohan because we have to now pass it to mr shri ayer because we have stolen most of his time you know um not at all thank you very much gentlemen it was a most uh, um and uh, a, a thrilling conversation to listen to two stalwarts who have data on your fingertips in fact if you remember microsoft's mantra was that windows will give you information on your fingertips today watching this gave us the same sense that you two gentlemen knew what you were talking about you know the ground you know the ground realities you know what needs to be done and you know how to get there and i'm sure a lot of good is going to come out of this i just wanted to add a couple of uh, pointers to the debate here before i throw open to questions gentlemen uh one thing sridhar ji uh, my information is a total of 52 city oh. councils are going to vote on this and a certain benefactor who has a visceral hatred of mr modi has set aside 156 million dollars that works out to 3 million dollars per city council if you think that one city council has six city council members each one is getting half a million dollar electoral war chest that is the kind of money we are talking about because that shows why some of these resolutions are um, complete across the slate it is there is no opposition at all so it's like the entire you know group has been given the money and when the uh, one of the mayors was challenged what the heck did you do here that person laughs it off and says oh you know what go to a republican elected city council and then have them pass a pro caa law first of all this gentleman has wasted my taxpayer money now he wants us to go and waste somebody else's taxpayer money i mean this is just nonsense what is going on another uh, uh council member when challen said oh this doesn't mean anything we're just doing this to get some brownie points because we know that by doing this we are sticking it to trump because trump supports india i mean all sorts of stupid logic being dished out here that is the status now we have our work cut out uh, mohandas pai ji we had the additional solicitor general join sridhar ji yes. in explaining caa and even a child could have understood that if people still want to go and vote the remaining 46 city councils i mean you are going to look very very foolish because foolish. believe it or not it's all getting recorded on pgurus it is getting recorded on data on the cloud it is not going to go away no amount of sanit sanitization is going to help you because when you start having ambitions of becoming a congressman believe me 
we will put show the mirror to you so that is my two cents on that sir the other interesting thing i wanted to share since we talked about this because whenever i say something about my own stuff people say oh you are using your own channel to promote yourself but i think it is important uh, um p gurus is beta testing on android platform the next generation social media software it's called vaad v a a d vaad in sanskrit means you know vaad vivaad we talk with yes. great yes. things sure. like that. i want to get something very short and something that we can all relate to the most important feature in this is it comes with built in translation so see today everybody still has to write it in english i said why not give the user the convenience of expressing his or her thought in the language that the person want now vaad when you download it for android and the iphone version is coming just a few days away all you need to do is it presets it for hindi translation you can go and change it to any one of the indian languages that are off offered what happens then is you can converse in the language you want the recipient on their side will also choose the language they would like to receive it in so you yes. suddenly now have cross the boundaries of not being able to get your point across we all think in our mother tongue although some now are thinking in english but the truth is that this needs to come out and this is our humble attempt at trying to make this happen so please beta test it give us your feedback and we will be very happy to help make this thing to the next level so sir for let's take some questions now we are about 56 minutes into the program i have a few questions for uh, you let's start with vibhav tanwar usa can bring modern technology and investment but usa can also bring enemies to india and where do evangelicals fit in this equation i'll let mohanda spaiji go first and then perhaps sridhar ji can chime in yes that is true that india has been a victim of the evangelicals coming from the united states and it's been a matter of concern the government has tightened up the visa condition the government has tightened up the fcnr rules to make sure that money does not mean and today because of social media many many young people are exposing their nefarious activities they are indulging in a hate uh, in a hate campaign of creating negativity and hatred uh, towards our religion and they're doing it in a manner which they must be exposed they're preying on young children they're preying on young children doing everything wrong i think much of it has gone away and i think many many indians are getting together and opposing it now it's been happening for a long time so it is not that tomorrow they're going to rush in again i think it's come, the intensity has come down because government has changed the rules they've been abusive they come to this country misuse our visa system and they're gone and they are uh, creating a hate campaign and uh, i think the people are now reacting and pushing them back uh sridhar ji well i think that uh, uh mohan has given you know pretty good answer i mean it's not just uh, as a united states citizen you know it's not just us it's 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 worldwide you know people are coming from not just us it's also coming from europe I, my advice would be two principles one there is a law of the land so the law of the land should apply whenever there is these type of activities which is contrarian and which is contravenes the law of uh, of of the local so i think that that would be my first in some instances i don't have the data to prove it's perhaps sometimes the governments turn blind blind eye and there is an exodus and flood of people coming in so that's not something that united states or anyone else can tackle that has to be tackled actually by uh, the indian government so that that would be my response thank you so much sridhar ji mohandas bhai ji uh, viewers at this point we are going to stop taking questions we have about a minute or two left uh, and i just have three more questions to go and then we will bring our program to a close chirant nadik wants to know this is from mohandas bhai ji what do you think about the way india is handling covid 19 i think india is handling it pretty well remember we have just about 42000 dead for 1.38 billion people that 30 i think 30 per million uh, in other countries are 450 500 etc uh, we have about 2 and 1/2 million infected and for 1.39 billion people it is quite less and the intensity of the virulence of the of the virus is coming down so you must remember we are a large crowded country people cannot be locked in forever we locked in early we stopped the spread but now in areas where we opened up it is coming up it still go ahead. but in many of the cities like uh, delhi and uh, mumbai it is flattening so you'll see this pattern for the next two or three months we'll go to new areas shoot up and again come down but uh, the death rate is below 2 today 
get rid is below two and we want to bring it down to one. I think India has done very well. Um, Sridhar ji, would you like to add to that? Uh, from a United States point of view? Yeah, just a little bit. I know we are under control. It is just right. taking a little longer, but it's going to take some iterations before it's going to flatten out. Yes, I think the only thing that I would say is that add to that point is, um, you know, each state has applied different set of rules and laws. For example, Florida and California opened up early, right? They never closed. And then when they picked it up, you know, it was a bit too late. And given the populous nature of these two states, you know, you began to see the the the, the advancement of, of, uh, of the transmission of the disease. So if you take that perspective that every state has followed a different principle, I think U.S. has, barring the media, U.S. has combated it better. Could it have been, could it have done a better job than what it has done? The answer is yes. Thank you, sir. Um, the next question is from Bharat Ved Prakash. Who do you believe will be better for India, Trump or Biden? Does Biden, Kamala statements with regard to CAA 370 concern you? Before I give you the chance, sir, I want to clarify one thing. Uh, viewers, I want us to be clear. When we are accusing somebody, we have to have facts on our side. The only statements that Biden and Kamala Harris made are against the freedom of communication in Kashmir. Remember, on August 4, 2019, 4G services and Wi-Fi were cut off for a small area of Kashmir Valley, some four districts or five districts. It is that that they have always complained in. I do not know of anyone where they said CA is bad, nor do I know of anyone where they said that 370 was bad. They were only complaining about this. That's not to say that they have not complained. They did do that part. And I think a lot of people have explained to them that even in the United States, if there is a terrorism incident, the internet and Wi-Fi around that area are sealed off for a certain amount of time till the law and order gets control of the situation. I think that is how it has to be looked at. So I give you the floor, uh, Mohandas Paiji, on how you see this. <laughs> well, there's, you know, you know Sri, we do know that in election time, you always cater to your constituencies to get the votes, right? Uh, because the ultimate objective of politician is to come to power by all means possible, right? So I think we, with all election rhetoric, once come to power, whichever government come to power in the United States, the Indian government is going to reach out, people are going to reach out, give them the data and facts. I'm sure they'll understand as people who are to govern a country. When you're outside, you can say what you want, do what you want. When you're governing a country, all the issues come up to you. It's the same thing for an opposition party in India today. If the opposition party can make all kinds of remarks, once they come into government, they will have to do the same thing any government did because there's no other option. You have to protect the life property of the people of the state. You have to fight the terrorists. You have to maintain law and order. To do that, there are some tools. You have to use them. And maybe some use more, some use less. So I won't go by anything that somebody is against India. I don't know. I don't think they're against India. Because, you know, India is very small in the world view as it is. It's part of election. Let's wait and see. Thank you, Mohan Das. Paiji, Sridharji, if you would like to add to that. Yes, I think uh, Mohan uh, gave a politically kind of neutral and correct answer, right? So I'll give a politically, you know, uh, shifting to the right answer. So I also go by only data, right? I don't go by anything else. I just read the context as to what has transpired between 2014 and 2020, right? Under Trump Modi administration. If I purely look at the data relative to what has happened between 2000 and 2014, when you had both Republican and Democratic administrations, purely on economic, strategic, trade and security, the progress that India has achieved and the shift in landscape of diplomacy and dialogue that has taken place under Trump and Modi regime, the trust and the camaraderie that exists between Trump and Modi is unique and differentiating, right? The facts and the data prove themselves. So to me, we are fighting for the status quo, which is to say for both these economies to flourish rather than have a straddle and a speed breaker and then move forward, which puts you back rather than takes you forward. We are thumping for Trump and make America great again. 
So that's my pitch. And, and I must put a disclaimer here that uh, Sridhar Ji's politics reflect Republican viewpoint. I'm a political independent. I'm not, I don't carry a briefcase for either Democrats or Republicans. I do call it the way I see it. I wanted to make sure that we understand the filter that we do apply when you are getting the answers. The last question, gentlemen. This no, I'm, very, I'm very clear. I made it very clear, Sri, which is there's no Absolutely. Dis- I am based on. Absolutely. And you did, absolutely. There is absolutely no doubt about that. Sometimes you have to reinforce it a few times just so we understand, right? So the last question from Santosh Bandur. Question is, data on agriculture is not available in India. This has been used as a tool to polarize in elections. How do we build database based on American best practices? Agriculture. No, I think we require, you know, we, we require, see, there's a lot of data available on agriculture, about production, capacity, per capita income, etc. We have to gather them. I've written a lot of articles in the Sunday Guardian on all of them, including agriculture, with a lot of data. I would urge the gentleman to read that. And two, the key is to collect all the data. We had the lefty saying with agriculture distress. And the time when they said agriculture distress, Modi came back to power with a larger majority. If the agriculture distress, there will be anti incumbency. There were no anti incumbency. Because I can say with data, no prime minister has done as much as the poor as Prime Minister Modi did in the five years of NDA 2's first stream. No prime minister has done. Enormous amount of data. We return on it. The data is clear. Go back to India's history. Right from independence, no prime minister has done as much for the poor. Even now in COVID, Modi, Prime Minister Modi has done more for the bottom 60% society, giving them free food grains, giving them money, giving them so much of relief. Compared to the middle class, he's not done anything for the middle class as yet. Hopefully, he will do something, but he has done it because you know, he understands the major problem of India is the 60% of people who are still poor, living on less than $2 a day. And his heart goes out for them. And you know, he is giving them houses, he's given them power, he's giving them, you know, uh, water right now, drinking water in the tap. He has uh, given the wills, roads for them, he has given them education, he has given them DBT, everything he has given them in a very large number. So I think we need to collect all this data. I think there is this uh, new data uh, group which has been set up. I think we can send you details and uh, just participate. I would urge you, the gentleman too, to just sub the web and collect all the data and start tweeting on it. Um, thank you, sir. And just to add to that, there is a website that has done extremely well in India. It's called data.gov. In. I have written a lot of articles and the research for that I obtained from this. This is maintained by the government. They've got slick graphics. I'm telling you, it's one of the best things that has happened to India in the last six or seven years. Very, very well presented data. So you have a lot of data, but you need to spend the time to find out what you want. But uh, in, in closure, gentlemen, it was my honor and privilege to watch this fireside chat, a scholarly discussion among two individuals who have accomplished a lot in their lives and i hope it is my hope and it is i'm sure our viewers hope that we'll have you back with us again in the days and weeks and months to come because we are in for very interesting times ahead we don't know the impact of covid worldwide things are going to take some left turns and sharp right turns so thank you once again mohandas paiji thank you once again sridharji and thank you thank you thank you thank you thanks thanks mohan Thank you, Sri. Thank you, Sridha. Thank, right. 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 thank, thank you. Great, 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 great dialogue. Enjoyed it very much. Great, great, great dialogue. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.